Now, O Most High Jupiter, thunder throughout your heavens, stretch forth your hand, your avenging flames prepare, rend the clouds and make the whole world quake. Let your bolts be poised with hands that choose neither me nor him. Whichever of us falls will perish guilty. Against us your bolt can make no error. Oh, hi, hello there. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby, and I am your host. She who started having like a bit of an existential crisis over how much she loves this in fucking incredible Roman play, only to decide like whatever, it's fine. It's seriously fucking good. Maybe the Romans were onto something, sometimes rarely, in this case. Yes, I know I'm being too mean to the Romans, but it's fun. This is the final episode of Seneca's Medea, and I just, I just, I can't properly express to you how, just how good it is. Like, I, uh, so I'll show you. Plus, on Friday, a conversation about it, which I just recorded, and which was <laughs> So much fun. You're going to love it. All of it. And oh my god, this will not be the last time we hear from Seneca. No. Where we last left this incredible, absolutely magnificently angry Medea, she was in the midst of fighting with Jason. It was getting nowhere. <laughs> surprise, surprise. So the topic moved on to their children. Medea is meant to say her goodbyes and then leave forever. But just the idea that Creusa will become their stepmother and might give them siblings is enough to push Medea deeper into her fury. She speaks of destroying all of her enemies, no matter who they are, no matter how many of them there are. And Jason? <laughs> well, Jason might be the most sniveling and pathetic of all Jasons, and he just responds by noting how he fears great power. No wonder he had Medea do all of his dirty work and then left her for someone else. Now, if only Medea could face that fully and give up asking him to change his mind and flee with her. And, well, content warning? Because everything you think you know about Medea, like, everything you do know, you know, all those things that she is very, very, very famous for, um, they're going to remain true in this play. Except that they're, those things, um, for the most part, you know, all those things that would happen very offstage in Euripides. They happen on stage in Seneca. So be warned, I guess? Like, I... You know what's coming. This is episode 226. There's nothing like a mad woman. Just a shame she went mad. When Jason tries to finish their conversation by saying simply that they've been talking too long and it's getting suspicious, Medea doesn't reply to him, but instead calls upon Jupiter. That's the quote I read at the top of the episode. She calls on Jupiter, asking him to strike them both down, and whichever of them falls, that's the one that's guilty. She's pretty confident. And what does Jason do? He asks her to calm down. He asks her to calm down. Then he adds, well, if there's anything you want uh, from my in-laws, now's the time to ask. He's a fucking revolting man, honestly. Of course, Medea doesn't want anything from them. At least nothing that isn't already within, well, within her rights. She doesn't want wealth, she says. She wants her children. She wants her children to come with her in exile. 
adding that Jason's going to have new children. To which Jason replies that as much as he'd like to give her what she wants, well, his fatherly love just can't allow him to endure that. No, he says, not even Creon could force him to give up these children. Quote, they are my reason for living. My scorched heart finds in them my comfort for my pain. And no, obviously no one considers motherly love, motherly devotion, irrelevant. There's no mentioning that, hey, maybe Medea has you know equal claim over the children. And maybe, I don't know, actually they fucking lived inside of her. <laughs> so maybe she should be given at least equal rights. But well, this is ancient Rome talking about ancient Greece, so we can't ask that much of them. Medea, anyway, seems a bit more concerned with how Jason feels about their children than she is about the children themselves. Seneca plays around here. I assume, you know, with with what Jason can and cannot hear from Medea, because she outright notes that, good, he loves his children that much. So now she knows she has a way to hurt him. And then to Jason, she simply asks to be permitted still to say goodbye to them, to give them one last hug. Then she adds one last request in apology for how she spoke to him just then. Quote, I've spoken out of turn. Forget about it. Let your memory of me be of my better self. Let what I said in anger be totally erased. And of course, Jason assures her, that's already done. No problem. But he adds... He's got one request of her, too. Quote, Control the fire in your heart and take things easy. Peace makes sorrows soft. And with that, Jason's gone, leaving Medea alone and ready to launch into a speech. She's got plans, you see. She is not finished with Jason, not finished with Corinth and its king and princess. She is not finished taking revenge for those that wronged her, not finished taking out her anger on people that deserve it, that asked for it, people that angered the fucking witch goddess woman from Colchis. He has gone. Can it be so? Go, Jason, forgetful of me and of all the deeds that I wrought. Have we fallen from your memory? No, we will never fall. To your task, summon up all your powers and arts. The fruit of your crimes is to count nothing crime. There is little room for fraud. We are held in fear. There, make attack where no one can suspect it. Hasten yourself now. Dare. Begin whatever Medea can and cannot do. (sighs) Yeah, that was a quote, obviously, from the Miller. (laughs) And that's right. We're finally going to get to the real Medea, the fun Medea, the witchy witch Medea. She speaks of her plans, or rather of planning her plans. She knows that everyone will suspect her of something nefarious, no matter what she does. So there's no point in pretending otherwise. Instead, she'll attack where and when no one will suspect it, because she won't be there. She turns to her nurse now, asking for help with her plan. I have a cloak, she explains to the nurse, a gift from the sun himself, proof to my father Aetes that he was descended from that god. I have a golden necklace, too, she says, and a golden band with glittering gems that I use to tie my hair back. These, she tells the nurse. Her children should bring as gifts from her to the bride. Quote, but first, let them be smeared and daubed with deadly poison. Let Hecate be summoned, prepare the rites of death. Let the altars be set up, let the flames ring through the halls. Gee, how do you think this is going to go for Creusa and Creon? Like, are they going to enjoy these gifts, do you think? <laughs> okay, no, it's a bit silly at this point in my own Medean sagas to pretend we don't know exactly what's going to happen next. But frankly, it's just too fun because her story is just too good, even if it is horribly murderous and we really shouldn't condone any of it. And I don't. I don't. Once Medea has announced her plans, spoken of, you know, smearing poison all over her gifts for the royals, for Jason's new family, you know, and she's invoked the name of Hecate. Well, the chorus 
chimes in. And once again, we get this very different chorus. A chorus that doesn't have a single kind thought for Medea, that doesn't side with her even for a moment. A chorus that wants only to sing of Jason's praises. It's fascinating, and it's a real departure from not only Euripides' Medea, but Greek choruses broadly. They tend to function very differently than they do in this play, usually providing a kind of commentary on the story in place of the audience, or at least being, you know, even somewhat neutral. Not these ones. I want to quote a large portion of this next choral ode because oh, it's, it's, it's really good. I'm just, I'm just as enthralled by others' opinions of Medea in this play as I am Medea herself. So this is from the Miller translation. No violence of fire or swelling gale, no fearful force of hurtling spear is as great as when a wife, robbed of her love, burns hot with hate. Not when cloudy Oster has brought the winter's rains and Hister's floods speed on, wrecking bridges in its course, and wanders afield. Not when the Rhone beats back the sea, or when the snows melt into streams beneath the sun's strong rays, and in mid-spring Hymus has dissolved. Blind is the fire of love when fanned by rage, cares not to be controlled, brooks no restraint, has no fear of death, it's eager to advance even against the sword. Have mercy, O gods, be gracious, we beseech you, that he may live in safety who tamed the sea. But the lord of the deep is enraged that the second realm is conquered, the youth who dared drive the everlasting chariot, heedless of his father's goal, himself caught the fire which, in his madness, he scattered over the sky. The familiar path has cost no mortal dear. Walk you where it was safe for folk aforetime. Don't break, rash man, the inviolable covenants of the universe." Whoever handled that daring ship's famous oars and despoiled Pelion of his sacred grove's thick shade, whoever entered between the roaming rocks and, having passed the perils of the deep, moored his vessel on a savage shore to return captor of foreign gold, all by a dreadful end atoned for the sea's outraged laws. It's so good. The chorus goes on. They speak of other men who were on the Argo with Jason, how they faced Ocean's punishment for taming the seas. Typhus, who was at the helm of the Argo, died in a foreign country on foreign soil, poor and alone. Orpheus, as we well know, was torn apart by Thracian women, his head bobbing along the Hebrus River. Hercules, after even all that he did, burned on a funeral pyre while burning from poisoned clothes. And Caius was killed by a boar. Meleager was killed by his own mother. Hylas, of course, died before they even reached Colchis, stolen by nymphs. Idmon was killed by a serpent. They go on and on, listing more and more men they were on the Argo that angered the oceans and were punished for it. Mopsus, Peleus, Thetis' husband, Ajax, Nophleus, Admetus avoided death, but only because his wife Alcestis took his place. Even, they add, Peleus, the king of Thessaly, who sent them on the quest in the first place, boiled to death in that heated cauldron, torn apart by his own daughters. The chorus's last line from the Wilson translation is just, quote, Now enough, O gods of your vengeance, Jason acted on orders. Jason can truly do no wrong in their eyes. Medea's nurse speaks of her and everything she's going through, everything she's doing. Quote, I have often seen her in her rages, attacking the gods, bringing down the sky, but horrors, greater horrors, Medea plans. The language Seneca uses in this play, gods, it's, it's just beautiful. It's so visceral and theatrical. Attacking the gods, bringing down the sky. He's putting on a show, exaggerating and blowing things up in a way that just doesn't happen in the Greek tragedies. 
they're much more staid and grounded and I just, not that not to say I prefer one over the other but gods this one is fun to read and even more fun to talk about the nurse begins to speak of what exactly Medea is doing in that moment how she is preparing her plans how she is plotting murder vengeance now reading this speech and then the speech of Medea that follows um so I'm going to just release a bonus episode if you want to listen to them in full because I I want to read them. So I'm going to. <laughs> For now, though, Medea's nurse describes her actions. Medea thunders to the sanctuary of death and it's there that she pulls out all of her treasures. Quote, things that even she has feared for years, she now takes out, unpacking her whole array of evil secrets long concealed. The nurse explains that Medea begins to summon her deadly, destructive powers. There, in the sanctuary of death, she pulls fiery heat from the sands of Libya, cold from the Taurus Mountains. Quote, she calls up every horror, drawn by her magic spells, the scaly ones slip from their holes. Medea literally calls snakes up from the earth. She pulls them to her. And snakes are chthonic. Mythologically, they live in both the upper world and the underworld because of those holes. One snake approaches, looking for victims, someone to kill, until Medea calls it to her, and it stops for only her, coiling itself to wait. She turns to the sky now, calling down monsters from the constellations themselves. She calls to the dragon, the bears, the serpent bearer. She calls to Python and the Hydra, and of course she calls to the dragon of Colchis. Quote, My always wakeful dragon, come to me. You were the first serpent I charmed to sleep. <gasps> With all the snakes gathered, God, so many snakes, Medea turns to the plants. She gathers all of the most poisonous of herbs, those she's so familiar with, but also all the varied sorts that others use to poison their weapons. Herbs from all over the world, quote, every plant whose blooming flowers bring death and deadly sap which lurks in twisted roots to bring up harm, she took them in her hand. Medea's nurse continues by listing all the varied places and regions where Medea had gathered her poisons, her herbs and flowers, whatever it was that would add to the magic that she's building. It's very reminiscent of the Medea section of Ovid's Metamorphoses, where she flies in her dragon chariot all around the world, seeking her magical ingredients. She explains much of Medea's process, how many of the plants had to be cut in the dead of night, or with an iron tool, or just with the pinch of a fingernail while speaking a charm. She speaks of how Medea squeezed the venom from snakes, how she mixed it with birds, an eagle's heart, the entrails of a screech owl. All of this Medea laid out before her. Quote, Some contain the devouring power of fire, others hold the icy cold of bitter frost. Medea adds words along with some of the ingredients. The words themselves are as dangerous as the plants and the snake's venom. Quote, she's chanting and the world is shaking at her spell. And then we hear from Medea herself. She's praying to, quote, silent hordes and ghostly gods, chaos obscure, dark home of shady dis, caverns of ugly death, bound by Tartarus spirits. Be free from your torments. Hurry to this new wedding. <laughs> she speaks of those punished in Tartarus, asking for Ixion's wheel to still, for Tantalus to get a drink, for Sisyphus to tumble down the mountain, for the Danaids to fill their urns. She calls to Hecate and her three forms, her three faces. She is barefoot. Her hair is down and wild around her. She's called down the rain from the sky. She's driven the ocean to sleep. She's confused. Even the sky, both sun and the stars are visible at once. She has bent and changed the very fabric of the world. This Medea is powerful. She is a witch to bend and break all other witches. 
She is everything. Once again, she speaks to Hecate, or to a Hecate who is actually connected with Diana by this period, like Artemis, both being moon goddesses. <sighs> Don't worry about this in a Greek context, because as far as I understand it, this conflation is very late and perhaps even like not even until the Roman period. Regardless, Medea begins to call to Hecate. <laughs> I have to read that bit. So this quote is adapted from Miller. To you, Hecate, I offer these wreaths wrought with bloody hands, each entwined with nine serpent coils. To you, these serpent limbs, which rebellious Typhaeus wore, who caused Jove's throne to tremble. In this is the blood which Nessus, that traitor ferryman, bestowed as he expired. With these ashes, the pyre on Eta sank down, which drank in the poisoned blood of Hercules. Here you see the torch of a pious sister, but impious mother, Althea, the avenger. These feathers the harpy left in her trackless lair when she fled from Zetes. Add to these the quills of the wounded Stymphalian bird which fell to the darts of Lerna. You have given forth your voice, your altars. I see my tripods shake by the favoring deity. <sighs> Medea watches the sky. She says that she sees Hecate overhead flying in her chariot. She speaks again to this version of Diana, one that is melded with Hecate, telling the goddess that it's it's her Medea does this for. Quote, For you I shake the gloomy branch from the waters of Styx. For you, bare-breasted like a maenad, I slash my arms with a holy knife. My own blood drips on the altar. Hands, get used to unsheathing the blade and submit to shed your own dear blood. She's preparing herself, not only for what she plans for Creusa, for Creon, but for, as she said it, her own dear blood. Medea continues to speak to the goddess, to call out to her. She apologizes, even, for having called to her so many times. Quote, for just one reason, always the same, Jason. And then, it's time. She calls for the goddess as she speaks of poisoning the robe she intends to give to Creusa. Quote, let a snaky flame burn up every marrow of her bones. <sighs> gods comparing this to euripides it's just it's so much more front and center all of it just everything it's bigger in greek tragedy the action almost always happens off stage it's described spoken about always in a messenger speech or almost always in a messenger speech rather than being you know depicted right there before the audience because that would have been it would have been too much it would have been too horrifying we may not have gotten to any uh explicit on stage violence yet but even the way medea speaks of this. The cloak and what it will do to Creusa feels like so much more than Euripides, <laughs> where all that happens is relayed after the fact by a witness who returns to explain what they saw. Not here. Not with this Medea. She wants to explain in great detail everything she's planned, everything that's going to take place, every violent, gory detail. She speaks of hiding that very fire stolen by Prometheus, a crime he paid for dearly, hiding it in the yellow gold of the jewelry she intends to give to Creusa. She says that, quote, I got from my cousin, Phaethon, the thunder of living flame. And then, guys, she says, quote, I have the gifts of the middle of the chimera. <gasps> That's my goat! She's talking about my beautiful, beloved, fire-breathing goat! She's got his fire! I'm sorry, I find that too cute. She says, too, that she has the fire of the bulls of Colchis, the very bulls she saved Jason from. She says even that she mixed this with the gall of Medusa, and that together they create a new and unique secret venom. She asks Hecate, 
to help her create these poisons, but also to hide them, to help her deceive her victims. She wants that poison to scorch, to melt flesh and bone. She wants the new bride, freshly married, to have her own fiery form, her fiery hair to outshine that very marriage torch. <sighs> this fucking speech. Medea now calls in her children. She calls for them to bring the gifts to the new bride, to their new stepmother. She asks them to make peace with her, even if their own mother is unlucky. She tells them to go, to bring the gifts to Creusa, and then to return to her, quickly, so that she can embrace them just one last time. And then the chorus sings. The chorus that, in a major departure from Euripides, again, hates and fears Medea. They are not impartial. They see nothing good in her. They don't pity her or understand her. They are against her in every way. They don't serve as a proxy for the audience. They serve to boost fear of Medea, to make her seem even more terrifying, even more evil than she's managed to do for herself. And she has tried. Gods, she has managed to do an awful lot of that herself. The chorus begins, quote, where is this blood-stained maenad rushing headlong, seized by barbarian lust? <sighs> they ask aloud what crimes she could be plotting, knowing there is nothing else that she would be doing, behaving as she is violent and furious. They speak of her expression, how angry she looks, how she looks wild, unhinged. They suggest, rightly, <laughs> that she is out to threaten the king. <laughs> they say that she looks like a tigress who's lost her cubs, that, quote, Medea cannot understand restraint for anger or for love. Now anger and love have joined to give her a cause. What will happen? Nothing good, Chorus, and nothing good. <laughs> but gods, if it isn't going to make for an incredibly gruesome final act. The Chorus's final lines signal the passing of time. They speak to Apollo, ask him to drive his chariot to let night take over for day. Quote, May Hesperus, night's leader, drown this fearful day. A messenger arrives on stage. <laughs> He's not subtle or quiet. He's crying out that everything is lost, that the entire kingdom of Corinth has fallen, that, quote, daughter and father together lie mixed with ash. He speaks to the chorus. And so this is the first time that the chorus has addressed anyone. The first time that they're not just serving this transitional narrative device, noting the passage of a scene or moment by amplifying the violence and danger of Medea or the qualities and heroism of Jason. No, now they're speaking. They ask the messenger what he's talking about. What horrors have happened inside the palace? When they ask how it was that the princess and her father, the king, have died, the messenger explains, quote, Devouring flame is raging through the palace, obeying some command. Now the whole house has fallen. People fear for the city. And while the chorus speaks to the messenger and panicking and speaking of dousing the flames that have already begun to devour everything, Medea's nurse addresses her. Now this is an interesting bit. We don't know how it was staged, but given the people on the stage, the people speaking, I think it's safe to imagine that the nurse and Medea are away from the chorus and the messenger, like speaking in hushed tones to each other, kind of hiding, while the others speak of battling the flames and the death of their kingdom. The nurse directs Medea to leave, to flee Corinth, finally, to find anywhere else to go because she just can't be there. But no, Medea isn't going to run. <laughs> she tells the nurse if she wasn't going to run before, why would she do so now? And then she seems to speak to herself, her own heart, even, quote, You are still in love, mad heart. If this is enough to see Jason unmarried? I really have a love-hate relationship with this idea that Medea still loves Jason after everything. It's interesting. It certainly changes how we see her and her actions, but it also just, like, does not feel like her character. She's better than that. But perhaps it's that she knows it. She can't control it. Thus, she's looking for more punishment for him. This isn't enough. Quote, Let all morality be gone and exile shame. That vengeance is too light, which clean hands can perform. <gasps> 
Oh my gosh. As these thoughts and feelings build within her, she looks back to the crimes that she's only just committed, this murder of Creusa and Creon. Those were trivial, ordinary. She was only practicing. Quote, could the rage of a girl do this? Now I am Medea. My nature has grown with my suffering. She continues, the fury in her voice surely growing with each statement. She says that she is happy that she killed her brother, tore him apart for her father to pick up the pieces. She's happy she stole the golden fleece, such a sacred item to her family. She's happy that she had Peleus' own daughters kill him with their bare hands. Now, she says, she has a new plan, but it's one that not even she fully knows, yet it hasn't revealed itself to her completely. Medea says that she wishes Jason had children by Creusa, calling her his concubine now in her death, whereas it was Medea who was concubine before. She wishes they had children, because that's the punishment he truly deserves. So, quote, children, once my children, you must give yourselves as payback for your father's crimes. This isn't an easy choice. She immediately berates herself, speaks of how awfully she feels about it, how, how the thought turns her to ice. She questions it. Can, can she really do it? Quote, can I spill my own children's blood? Flesh of my flesh? No, no. What terrible madness. Horrible thought. No, no, she can't. She can't. She wants to unthink it, to take back even the notion. Their children have done nothing wrong. They, they don't deserve to die for their father. Their only crime, she says, is that their father is Jason, that their mother is Medea. Her words convey her mind. She is she's no longer able to think fully rationally, to be shrewd and thoughtful as she has been. She goes back and forth. The children are hers. They should die. The children aren't hers. They should die. They're innocent. But then so was her brother. <sighs> Medea cannot reckon with herself right now with what she's thinking of doing. She's fighting with herself with her own words. Quote, as when the wild winds make their brutal wars and on both sides the seas lift up discordant waves and the unstable water boils, even so my heart tosses and churns. And gods, if that isn't a line ripped straight from the epic tradition. Eventually, she calls her children to her, asking them to come, to embrace her, to comfort her. She says she wants Jason to have them, but, but only if she can get them too. Then she explains that she must go into exile, that it won't be long until they're taken from her. But then she says that Jason should lose their affection if it's lost to her already. Quote, my ancient fury seeks my reluctant hands again. Anger, I follow your lead. Medea wishes that she had been like Niobe, that she had had many, many children, just like that woman had. Quote, I was infertile for revenge, but my two are just enough to pay for brother and father. And then she sees the Furies. And we all know what that means. Where hasten that headlong horde of furies? Whom do they seek? Against whom are they preparing their flaming blows? Whom does the hellish host threaten with its bloody brands? A huge snake hisses, whirled with the writhing lash. Whom does Megara seek with her deadly torch? Whose shade comes there dimly seen, its limbs all scattered? It is my brother, and his punishment he seeks. We'll pay, yes, all the debt. Plunge your brands into my eyes. Tear, burn, see. My breast is open to the Furies. <laughs> I can't not. That was from the Miller translation, obviously, because I had to. Medea sees the Furies, and it doesn't take long for her to realize that, of course, they're there for her. I mean, she called them, after all. Most people don't call for the Furies, but Medea does. She seems to see her brother there, too, Epsirtus, returned to her just as she prepares to avenge him. Quote, leave me, brother, and you avenging goddesses, and order your ghosts to go back safe to the depths of hell. <sighs> Medea then decides that she will climb up to the roof of the palace. She asks that all those with her to come up. This seems to imply that she's talking to both the children, but maybe also the ghosts that she's seeing around her. Jason's there now, but he's speaking to the people of Corinth, and not to Medea. 
He asks that anyone loyal, anyone mourning the deaths that they've just witnessed, their king and princess, come with weapons to force Medea off the roof. Notably, he doesn't ask them to join him in doing that, though he does say that he'll arrest her. But this Jason is hands off. This Jason has people to do the dirty work for him in ways that even the other forms of Jason didn't emphasize quite so completely. Once Medea is on the roof, she announces that she's regained her own throne. Speaking to or of her father and her brother, she is... She's in a state. She's everywhere. Her thoughts spiraling. She's seeing things, both the dead and the living, her family, those she betrayed for Jason and their children, too. She announces that not only has she regained her throne through her actions, but the golden ram is returned to the Colchians, and even her stolen virginity is returned to her. Which, yeah, I think means that she would have just killed one of her children on stage. Because it's that death of an oldest child that means that everything she did for Jason is just reversed. But she goes back and forth. Her mind, just, it's all over the place as she speaks of what she's done and what she plans to do. Again, I'm going to recite this entire speech as a bonus. Because, wow. But when she sees that Jason is below, watching her, that's when she realizes what she needed. That's the push. She needed him to be her witness. She needed an audience. She still got one child left to kill. Quote, Heap up a funeral pyre for your own sons, Jason, and strew the burial mound. She's already killed one son. She announces this to Jason, and one can only assume shows him, before saying that the other son will die soon in the same way. But this time, Jason will watch. And this is where I remind you again that in Greek tragedy, this would always happen off stage. Always. This is a departure. This is something entirely new. This is a woman killing her children on stage while their father watches from below. It is fucked up in a way that nothing before had been fucked up. I really can't emphasize that enough. As if, you know, it's not obvious. Jason responds by, shockingly, actually taking some responsibility. But not until after he insists that he never betrayed their marriage. Then he says that if there was a wrong, he did it. Which really only vaguely takes responsibility, but the bar for Jason is in the ground. He wants Medea to kill him instead, he says, but, well, Medea knows which would hurt more. She responds, quote, I will drive my sword into that very spot which hurts you most. Now, proud man, go off and marry virgins. Leave mothers alone. God, she is good. Jason again tries to convince her that that's enough, that killing one son is more than enough revenge. But no, it's not enough. She tells him that even two isn't enough to satisfy her. Quote, if my womb, even now, contains any pledge of our love, I, the mother, will scrape my insides with my sword. I will bring it out with the blade. Yeah, that's Medea announcing outright that if she happens to somehow be pregnant with another of Jason's children, she will give herself an abortion right then and there. Because she as a mother, can. And fine, I know that this is probably not a reference that should be used to people who want to force people to give birth. But gods, do I want to anyway. The way she says that she, as the mother, can do it, I just... With that said, Jason throws another few meaningless pleas to her. But she's done. She's not having it. By this time, she's already killed their other child. It's finished. He wants her to kill him, too, but that would be too kind to Jason. Instead, I want to imagine she just laughs because she questions him daring to ask her for pity before later adding, quote, Do you not know your wife? This is the way I always leave a country. The way in the sky lies clear. Her dragon chariot is awaiting her. 
the way she always leaves a country. Exile, murder, destruction. Why would he imagine anything would be different this time? She's not done taking it out on him, though. She says a line next that, oh my god, this Wilson translation. I may have shriek laughed when I read it. Because she says to Jason, presumably holding out the dead bodies of their murdered children, for him to take from her. She says, quote, Now, daddy, take your children back, but I will fly amid the winds on my chariot with wings. Daddy. Emily Wilson translates it as her calling him daddy. Magnificent, dark, weird, fucked up. Just like this play. And not to worry, we will talk about this line in Friday's conversation because how in the living fuck could I not? The last line in Seneca's Medea is for Jason. And he says, quote, Go, travel on up high through the deep expanse of the heavens. Prove that there are no gods wherever you go. No gods wherever you go. (sighs) This fucking play. I just, I have no words. I really don't. I mean, I know it's it's horrible, obviously, but like, it's really good. And the script is almost 6,000 words, though, so I will just leave everything else that remains to be explored to the conversation episode airing on Friday with Lauren Ginsberg because, oh, that one's good. It was so much fun. We talked about everything. There's so much more to this play than even I was able to gather. I just, I cannot wait for you to hear it. <sighs> And I'll leave you with a review. This one comes from a user called T and Crochet from the UK. Precious username. Thank you. Came for the mythology. Stayed for the humor, honesty, and humanity that Liv brings to this amazing podcast. I love learning with Liv. Short and sweet. Thank you so much. But before I fully leave you all with this deeply fucked up and yet entirely incredible play. Given everything um, happening right now, there's just something I have to say, uh, because I'm me. Everything is on fire. My province is burning. The East already burnt up entirely. The Northwest Territories are on fire. And there isn't a word from the Canadian government about how it is all happening in large part due to our continued export and reliance on fossil fuels. We are doing this. We are literally fueling the flames that are fucking devouring this country along with the rest of the world. And we're just going to sit back and watch it all happen before getting into an enormous fucking truck for no fucking reason and watching as the cops beat and arrest anyone, let's be honest, usually indigenous people, who are trying to stop or even slow the continued reliance on fossil fuels, let alone the logging of old growth forests, whatever of them haven't already burnt the fuck up. If you're Canadian... Be angrier, be louder, and if you are not, fuck, do the same thing. But every time you think of Canada as this nice little place up north that's conned you into thinking all we do is say sorry and live in some make-believe world where the grass is always greener, remember that we're one of the absolute worst countries when it comes to making the climate crisis worse. And while you might think because our prime minister is young and good-looking and plays the good liberal that he wants you to think he is, remember... That that man is bought and sold by the oil industry, and he is more than happy to watch the country and the world burn, just so that Alberta can keep pumping out fossil fuels. Let's Talk About Myths Baby is written and produced by me, Liv Albert. Michaela Smith is the Hermes to my Olympians, perhaps more colloquially known as the assistant producer. The podcast is hosted and monetized by iHeartMedia. Listen on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. Help me continue bringing you the world of Greek mythology in the ancient Mediterranean by becoming a patron. We'll get bonus episodes and more. Visit patreon.com slash mythbaby or click the link in this episode's description. Oh, also, there's a Spotify playlist of Medea episodes, and I might be adding songs now because of the title of this episode. You're welcome. I am Liv, and despite capitalism laughing as the world burns down around us, I do love this shit, even when it's an imperial Roman author, because holy living fucking hell, this play is amazing. I'll never get over it. Thank you.